We've, we've assembled uh, an esteemed panel here to talk about retinal drug delivery, which uh, you see a lot of panels on this because it's really still one of the big unmet needs in retina. And we'll try to take a little bit of a different angle in this panel and try to put a framework around how we're gonna talk about drug delivery and then have a panel discussion. Now, in, in, uh, at OIS, as you know, we tend to talk about uh, innovation as the innovation cycle of how innovations move through inception by an inventor and then moving forward with some sort of entrepreneurial management team that requires capital, often from venture capital, and then ultimately uh, gets FDA approved and might go public or be bought by a company. And it's really a daunting task that requires, it takes a village to do it, uh, different constituents. And we've tried to pull together some of the different constituents of the innovation cycle here in the panel. We have uh, Gene Dewan, who needs no introduction, who really is an uh, inventor and entrepreneur in retina and specifically in drug delivery and uh, founder of Foresight Labs. We had Angela talk about what Foresight does earlier. Uh, we have Dan White from Clearside, who is an entrepreneur and CEO, who is actually one of the founders of Alamera. That is now a public company with Alluvian that was one of the pioneers of long-term injectable uh, drug, drug delivery therapy. Uh, we are lucky enough to have Greg Gunberg, Grunberg, one of the uh, venture capitalists brave enough to invest in drug delivery uh, with Longitude Capital, which has been very successful in ophthalmology and specifically in drug delivery. Greg uh, is on the board of Kala Pharmaceuticals and several other uh, important ophthalmology companies. And then in this panel, we've also tried to bring in a couple of clinicians because none of this works unless it's used by the clinical uh, retinologist. And I'm lucky enough to have two old friends and uh, guys that I trained with back in the day. Uh, we all trained back in the 80s, we hate to admit. But we have uh, Dr. Mark Wheeland uh, from uh, California who trained with me at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia and Dr. Mark Ballas, who's at the Retina Center of Maine, who is a fellow with me at Mass Iron Ear. And these guys, we, we diverged 25, 30 years ago. I went through the gates of Hades down into the business world as venture capitalists, but they continued to build private practices doing high volume uh, retina care. And as they would describe it, curing blindness one eye at a time. And they really are what we need to do to create products. They need to be able to use them have them be good for patients and for everybody for the economics to work out. And we'll try to try to cover some of that in the discussion. Uh, one thing I do have here is a first of kind. We're gonna have a grand rounds case presentation to start out, which actually the panel has not seen, just, just to test these guys. So if we could have the first slide. At Will's Eye Hospital, we used to have something called eye openers, where at 6.30 a.m. we got cold called with cases, and we had to say what they were. So in this case, I'm going to turn it over to, to Mark and Mark uh, to tell me, uh, this is the fundus of a patient, what, what do you see there? Looks like there are a few white dots. <laughs> hey, I could have said that. Correct so far. Dr. Wheeland, any, any thoughts? Well, there's a sort of a pattern of white dots. It's not typical for some diseases like AMD, so it's probably not AMD. It's maybe a white dot syndrome. White I dots. think it's iatrogenic. Someone pointed their laser in there and made a little grid pattern. Laser grid pattern, okay. It certainly could be iatrogenesis imperfecta. Um, <laughs> unclear. Now, Dr. Dewan, we could bring you in here. Any, any, any thoughts on this? Uh, no, I agree. <laughs> Let's get some imaging. Please. Well, I'll, I'll give you a hint. This, this relates to drug delivery. So this is a crystalline maculopathy. Does anyone remember what that, that is? Okay. So now, does this help you out? What, can you give us more of what might be going on here? So you're thinking this is a, a talc retinopathy uh, from someone shooting up intravenous drugs? No. No, I didn't say no. It, yeah, so it, it, it's a little unclear. One of the things that we like to do <clears throat> is take studies, right? We like to visit, you know. So I would get an FA and an OCT on this, but just looking at it, could be talc, but talc would be a little bit of a different distribution, I think, and it could also be a hereditary form of uh, retinopathy. We also ask for histories. 
<laughs> First, for, I'm, I'm, I'm here to answer any questions. So this is a 30-year-old uh, uh, musician who came in for a routine eye exam. Is he complaining of visual loss? No, no symptoms. Does he have any history of drug use? Yes. Intravenous or? Yes. Oh. <laughs> ding, 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 Dr. Ballas, talc retinopathy. So this is from injecting intravenous drugs with the impurity talc in it, and it ends up in your retina. And I first saw this in Philadelphia Wills Eye Hospital. This is retinal drug delivery <laughs> by a needle. <laughs> gets directly to the macula. <laughs> think, think about that. So, but thank you very much, and uh, special prize for Dr. Ballas for getting that first, but uh, good, good case. So we now resume our regularly scheduled program. So let's, let's go, what, what I saw this, this is reminding me, I was in a band in medical school of the needle and the damage done, the famous Neil Young song, that initially needles were damaging the retina with things like this. But what's interesting is retinal drug delivery today <laughs> is about needles going, in this case, into the eye instead of somebody's arm to deliver drugs. And for the most part, this is what we're dealing with mostly intravitreal anti-VEGF injections every month for patients. And when this was first introduced, and Emmett will remember this as one of the early people at iTech, people thought this was preposterous. People on both sides of the needle, so to speak, said, Who, what doctor would want to be wanting to do intravitreal injections? What patient would want to come in monthly to get a needle stuck in their eye? But as we all know, and we saw some of this data earlier, this has been an exponential growth market. This is just the US numbers. It's a global phenomenon of intravitreal injections for retinal drug delivery. And people said, this, this can't be done. The doctor's offices couldn't, could never handle this. But retina specialists, being entrepreneurs, quickly evolved their business model so that they could borrow from another high volume injection model and inject eyeballs very efficiently and make it work in, in their practice. And so now we have the most commonly performed procedure maybe in the world, intravitreal injections, six million a year alone in the US for the treatment of one of the most common retinal diseases, macular, macular degeneration. So uh, what are we doing to solve this problem, you would think? Now, anti-VEGFs were approved 15 years ago, so more than that, 05, 06, that you would think that we would have something better in retinal drug delivery. But let's look at what's going on with the available retinal drug delivery things. And here, we've tried to set up a kind of way of thinking about them, of looking at the therapies, of whether they are something permanent that goes in the eye or something that can be resorbed, or, and whether they are uh, something that requires surgery versus being injectable. And to just quickly review where we are on this, the first breakthrough was really back in very long ago in 96 with Vitrocert for AIDS patients, but that became a more commercial product with a steroid, uh, Redacert, and now from Bausch and Loam uh, in two 2005. The next approval was for Ozudex from Allergan for dexamethasone in 2009, and that's a pretty big product now. That's about a 300 million a year product uh, after F a long time after FDA approval. Alluvian from, uh, from Alamera, a 2014 approval. And again, the theme here, these are all very small injectables or surgical implants. And then this one, I would consider drug delivery, the breakthrough with gene therapy from uh, Spark Therapeutics, Lux Turner, that spoke earlier. Uh, this is really using a virus as a drug delivery platform to get to the retina. And because it goes away, I think we could think of it as a resorbable drug delivery platform. So when we, when we talk later, we can, there's a lot of debate about is intuitively, I think the uh, investors and maybe the uh, pharmaceutical industry would think that a injectable resorbable would be the optimal approach, but that may or may not be true and we can, we can talk about that. The other thing that's notably lacking here, where are the anti-VEGFs? These are, these are old drugs. These drugs are from the 1950s, and they're mostly being injected through a syringe that was invented in the 1850s. 
<laughs> we have amazing drugs, gene therapy, anti-VEGFs, that have been bioengineered, and we're putting it through technology that could be 100 years old. So we gotta figure out why is that still happening and what's, what's holding up the marketplace. And, and finally, we've all seen these slides with all the, so there's, everything is being tried now, all kinds of different approaches. I've tried to give just a partial list of, uh, of companies that are working on this at Logos. I apologize, I left off Irenix that presented earlier that has another device approach to this. And we're hoping that through all this activity that we could see something that would maybe translate into more clinical use for some of the more elegant drugs that we're, that we're using here. So I think now we can transition to the panel. I, what I came away from looking at this, I want a new drug. We need something better than old drugs being delivered through new platforms. Can we get to something that's delivering some of the newer plat drugs and hopefully on something better than a needle, a needle in the eye? So maybe we can start off with some, with some questions here and I'll transition over to uh, join the crowd. And uh, the first question really, is we have so many people here in the audience that are working on the problem. We've got venture capitalists funding this. Uh, but what is the problem as seen by people who are working on these patients every day? Uh, what, what do you two guys see that are out there practicing as the biggest unsolved problem? I think at this point it's really increasing the duration of anti-veg activity. And as we get better um, products, I think that maybe the issues will change. But right now, uh, increased uh, durability. I think that the, the other issue, you know, we sort of go down the list, you know, you talk about uh, patient compliance, Mark and I were talking about this earlier. I think the other big issue is under treatment. And sort of believe it or not, uh, it's more like doctor compliance, getting the patients in and getting them treated. Yeah, I, I agree. It's uh, <clears throat> in order to prepare for this uh, meeting, I did a quick PubMed search, and the most uh, leading article I found was from 2004. So there certainly is room for uh, new innovation to come along. And um, you know, Mark, Mark and I were having this discussion beforehand. It is kind of uh, sad to think that 12 years ago we had the Anchor and Marina data that come out that showed you could, uh, on average, gain two lines of visual acuity for patients with wet AMD, but we're still at that. Uh, point today. We really haven't had any new treatment that's improved the visual outcome any more than that. And uh, as Mark alluded, the long-term studies show that the average patients tend to revert to uh, baseline, and that may be more due to uh, under-treatment over time. Okay. Any other, other comments? I would, I would say uh, I, I tend to agree. The one thing that I've observed over time is that uh, if it's doctor compliance or patient compliance, this compliance issue is such a huge problem, and it's a problem really across all of ophthalmology, and particularly in retina where it can lead to blindness or massive loss of vision, and yet it's not entirely clear to me that FDA has really embraced that as the problem as they challenge companies with regard to trial design. There have been a couple exceptions, but certainly not the rule, and it, and it seems to make the bar higher than necessary to really advance the standard of care. Why don't we go, if we go to the next, uh, next slide. Uh, can we, there we go, great. Uh, so we've got some needs, but what, what's actually working, what's working in the marketplace? What have been the biggest breakthroughs? As, as again, we'll start with the clinicians that, what, what are you guys using or what do, what's working in your practice that, that is a drug delivery technology besides the syringe. Well, I think the gancyclovir implant must be the most successful because it's not even available anymore, so it's completely cured the problem. Um, but <clears throat> I remember uh, giving my first uh, intravitreal injection of gancyclovir back in 1991 to an age patient with CMV retinitis, and uh, you know, back then we rarely did intravitreal injections, maybe only for Ooh. patients with bacterial endophthalmitis, and, <laughs> and this was uh, vision saving for patients who otherwise would go blind but were too sick to tolerate intravenous therapy. Um, the time to, uh, you know, the, but the burden, we talk about the burden now, those patients used to get intravitreal gancyclovir injections every week until they stabilized and then every two weeks. And when the implant came out in 96, you know, that had a duration of action of about six to eight months, which was probably as long as the lifespan of most of the AIDS patients at that time. And it was much more effective than systemic therapy, uh, which tended to, 
expose patients to all the systemic risks of neutropenia, uh, but also the CMV retinitis recurred at about three months or so on IV therapy compared to the uh, implant. The other thing that I would say is that before we did the injections on those patients, we treated them with an indwelling catheter, and they had to hook up and get IV therapy for a couple hours every day with its, you know, uh, associated uh, problems of nephrotoxicity and whatnot. So this really was a game changer. Um, but this was also really the advent of intravitreal injections, and I, I think that they're certainly here to stay for a while. They're, they're effective, and there's not a whole lot of morbidity. Uh, they're certainly not elegant, but they work. Were you guys surprised that, that intravitreal injections were taken up so easily by the clinical community, and, and it, it, I mean, you look at those numbers. I don't true. think they were taken up easily. I remember giving a presentation at the Nantucket Retina meeting in 2006 where I presented uh, data on treating patients with uh, diabetic macular edema with Avastin, and I was pretty much laughed off the podium. I was like, who is going to inject these patients two or three times a year? That's insane. <laughs> so, uh, but now, obviously, it is the wave as we're doing, you know, millions of injections a year. <laughs> I think anti-VEGF therapy was so powerful that nobody had a choice. I mean, if your friend, your mother, your patient walked in with CMV, and I, I remember, you know, I was, I was the president of the ASRS when Genentech presented the data. I, you know, I, I said it was like, it must have been like, you know, being a physician when you heard about penicillin. I mean, it was so... That can't be. Patients with AMD get better. And then all this big study, and then, you know, Phil gets up and he says, you know, here I did three patients, two patients and with Avastin. And so you had a miracle drug and you couldn't get it. I think it was the biggest mistake ever done by a company <laughs> saying, we're not going to give you this miracle drug for your patients. But if you need it, there's, you know, this $50 drug that you can you can use, and I remember trying to do it. At, I was at uh, USC at the time, and I wanted to do it. I had gotten three patients, one from Atlanta, one uh, a lawyer from from San Diego, and, and a patient local, and I had them scheduled, and I had the hospital make it for the first time. And they wouldn't let me do it because of the medical legal issues, and they were afraid and all of that. They said, you can't do it. I said, you can't tell me I can't do it. I, I'm going to do it. And they said, no, we're, we're going to take away your insurance. So, so I sent those patients to Bob Avery. And Bob had done one or two at that time. The lawyer called me back. He was a young guy, 30 years old. And on his way back driving to, to San Diego, he says, my vision's getting better in his drive back. And then all of a sudden, you know, when you have something that you can see working dramatically, then, then game over. You know, you had no choice. And I, and I think, you know, it, it, was, it just changed our whole, now we have six million of them, you said, wow. I think, bring, I think you bring up a great point. I mean, as an entrepreneur and you're thinking about starting a company, there are very few drugs, as you can see on this list, that you can actually work on as drug delivery. And you can't work on somebody else's uh, anti-VEGF molecule. So you're typically stuck with gancyclovir or steroid. And guess what? No one uses gancyclovir anymore, as you mentioned. But the bar that was set by Genentech in both not only AMD, but the other diseases as well, is an extraordinary high bar. And so the cost of these clinical trials are just immense. We have to think about financing this stuff and trying to figure out what, how, this, how this drug goes together. So that's one of the biggest challenges we have in this room is how you, how you make an innovation, bring better drugs or better, make drugs better with the amount of capital we're able to raise. It's just a tough, tough nut to crack. Is there, because it is interesting how so many of the drug delivery platforms are on steroids. And again, so what about the clinical imp implementation of that in, at the clinical level? Do you, do you need another injectable steroid? Are you guys using it? Uh, what's, I think if what's you go view? into a retinologist's office, you're going to see very little intravitreal steroid getting injected. I think lots of times this is a proof of concept and maybe a combination therapy as we move forward. Yeah, I agree. I think the risk-benefit profile of the anti-VEGF drugs is so much better than for the steroids where you have to worry about rising intraocular pressure and cataract formation. 
Yeah, we totally agree with that. It's uh, the clear side because we believe that you have to do something about the side, side effects without losing the benefit of the steroids. But steroids dry up the retina really quickly and maybe even faster than an anti-VEGF in many cases or some of these cases where they don't respond to anti-VEGFs, what are you going to choose? You have to go back to a steroid. So you can't really say, I'm not going to use them. We know what VEGFs do and we're getting a better feel for how they, they, they react. You're going to have to do something for your patient. You don't want to hook them back up to some kind of a weird technology to, to, to bring them back. Why don't we go, if we can go to the next, n next question, because we're kind of segueing to that anyway. So we've got this intravitreal paradigm, but if we could get people working on something else, is there an obvious other better way to get the drug in? We saw that uh, uh, intravenous uh, heroin is a good way to get some, a way to the, through the retina. We're not going to do that, but these are just some proposed choices, but are we, are we working on the right things? So, uh, you know, I think, and I polled a bunch of doctors as well before I came to this panel, that intravitreal injection was natural because you're doing surgery back there anyway. So it, going through there seemed to be like a natural thing. According, anyway, according to David Boyer when, he, when I asked him this last night. Um, but orals, topicals, I just haven't been able to buy into that quite yet. I haven't seen it reach the retina in meaningful amounts of, of, um, of uh, drug to, to make a difference. Intravitreal works great for uh, any VEGS. I don't know how we're going to change that or make that better or worse. I think there's some really innovative stuff going on with, with Gene's work and some of the work at Genentech that I've heard about. Um, for the steroid side, obviously, I'm partial to supercortical delivery, but uh, you guys know how I feel about that. Um, and, 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 you know, subretinal is meant to include, you know, su supercoroidal in this. But one, I, I have a question, is the way that ophthalmology works, would it be easier to have a drug that was administered by the ophthalmologist as opposed to maybe an oral or topical drug? Should, should people not even try that because it's going to be too hard to get adoption? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> the risk of oral and, and topical is systemic side effects. And so even with, a, with an eye drop, it's been estimated that only about 5% of the medication gets into the eye and the rest is mainly systemically absorbed. And so if we are concerned about potential side effects of anti-VEGF drugs, for example, we might want to avoid that route. And I think subretinal or supercroidal uh, sounds really fascinating to me. And I'd love someone to work on those routes and see if we can get more of a sort of one and done uh, type by uh, you know, doing something similar to what we've seen with uh, genetic uh, presentations this morning. You know, the, I, I think of it a little bit different. I think of you have a drug that works. So drug delivery, I don't see it like a platform. I mean, even though they can be platforms, I understand that. But it's, they're really a therapy, enabling a therapy. So every drug has to be delivered in a very specific way. And it has a unique pharmacokinetics. And it, it, you know, and it, pharmacodynamic uh, capability uh, modifies the disease. And so it's, it's all extremely integrated. It's the drug plus the delivery system. And if you had a completely safe oral therapy that would prevent AMD, you know, bring it on. But there's, you know, when, you know, uh, probably Greg has one, but I don't, you know, and that it's, uh, w but what we did know is that multiple injections of an anti-VEGF were fixing, were killing every retinal physician, you know, they, they were, you know, act, they were making good money, but they weren't having fun, and, and, and the patient, you know, I, me, I, you know, I, yes, Ms. Jones, you're doing fine, uh, why don't we see you back next month? You know, that, that's just a little bit of edema, you know, and so it's, I, I really think that it, it, it's very, very specific. Sometimes you need steroids, sometimes you need antibiotics, sometimes, you, you know, you need an anti-VEGF, and every one of those is extremely specific and based on the drug, and so that's, so it, it, platforms are not really, you're not, when you're talking about drug delivery, you're not really talking about a platform talking about a specific therapy. And in many cases, it's not only the technology that's driving it. I mean, the other elephant in the room is that 
intravitreal injection reimbursement has gone down quite dramatically. You guys are doing probably 10 times what you were doing about three or four years ago. I was just in a meeting with the head of McKinsey, and he was talking about that number of patients over the age of 65 by the time 2035 is going to, we're going to double that number. You're going to have to figure out how are you going to accomplish that when you're already complaining a lot about the number of intravitreal injections that you're currently doing. It's going to have to either come through drug delivery or better management or more doctors, one of the three. I think the thing that uh, we grapple with is sort of the, the size of the swing that we want to take, because on one axis you have sort of you know feasibility, right? Is this something that can actually be achieved, right? And the other hand, on the other hand, you have cost and time. How much is this going to cost to get there, and how much time? And we can get paralyzed there because on one hand, incremental solutions that can get adopted, but how much value are they creating to the system, and are they really going to help undo the rhythm of current deployment of? Dev uh, uh, procedures and injections, and on the other hand, of course we'd love a, a topical drug or an oral drug that had no side effects, but how much risk are we going to be able to expose our fund to or other LP capital sources to in order to hit this holy grail? And I think as we flash forward, that's why it's been challenging to get some of these opportunities funded over time, and trying to find that balance is very tricky. You know, I do think uh, Gene had a good point, which is the drug sort of drives the decision-making process. So if you're talking about gene therapy, I think you want to get it close to the RPE, and maybe that's subretinal, maybe it's supracroidal, who knows, but you got to get it where, where it's going to act. Um, I would also say, although there are some really, uh, I think, wonderful new approaches uh, coming up that necessitate a trip to the OR, if we can do it in the office, I think that that's going to be the best of all worlds. You can do everything in the office. <laughs> I can't put an RPDS in the office right now. That might be a good segue. Right maybe, now, maybe we could have our next, our next, next question up. Um, which, uh, you know, we, we often see as a venture capitalist, and Greg, I'm sure it's the same, you know, we see all kinds of different value propositions, and this is what the big break, breakthrough is. And a lot of things sound good, but may not be actually that practical. And I, I'd be curious from the panel here on some of these, these types of things that, you know, a company might be focused on very much, they need a resorbable therapy, and re, uh, non-resorbable would never work. Or it has to be 25 gauge or smaller, or no one's going to use it. And love a reaction from, from you guys on, uh, on this. I, 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 you know, it's, it's all about the clinical outcome. I mean, you know, so you can do brain surgery and take out the tumor with a 25 gauge, but it only works half as often. You know, <laughs> I don't care. And uh, it, it has to be, has to be appropriate for the disease. And so the, you know, the, the Genentech port delivery system that we developed, you know, has a 3.2 millimeter incision. It's no suture. You know, it's pretty, it takes five minutes. Of course you can do it in the office. You could. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that kind of thing, it, what's the right period of, you know, how long does it have to last? You have to, it happens in one eye. You have to watch the other eye. You're not going to. You're going to have to see that patient back every six months. In the other eye, not just for the treated eye. You know, office ASC. I don't think it really matters. It's all financially driven anyway. As soon as they stop paying it for the ASC, it's going to go to the office 100%. It doesn't have to be 25 gauge. It just has to be sutureless and quick. And that's kind of where I, where I. Um uh, am puzzled because this is effectively a whole conversation around non-inferiority plays, right? It's if, if this were non-inferior to that, what would you prefer? And I think there are rational minds that might say, of, of course, longer is better, et cetera. But in a non-inferiority world, it really comes down to business model, which is how, how hard is it going to be to, you know, if you had a, something you could inject every six months or a year, what does that really do to your practice? And, and, and what is the true motivator? And that fundamentally is economic. In a world where you've got something superior, right, and maybe it's a combination, maybe it's something that ClearSide's going to be able to do or others in this room, then it's back to what Gene's been saying, which is you have to do that. It's superior. And then the whole conversation flips. So, so to me, this is just a very practical follow-the-money chain 
Uh, and I'm sure there's some economists that could help us figure that. <laughs> and I think it's been around for years. The, the, the biggest market uh, need we believed was more duration between the frequency of injections, but you, you have to agree with me, you can't give up controlling the retina earlier and faster, making sure that you're treating the disease more, more effectively. It just can't be about duration. It has to be, you have to make that drug better, and the incremental benefit has got to drive a business model. And when these patients are costing 120 grand a patient to put into a clinical trial and you're running 400, 500 patients, it, it is not cheap. You know, AMD, AMD, if you make the diagnosis early, if you make the diagnosis before 2040, if you treat it every, you know, you, if you treat every month, you know, a Lucentis or ILA actually, you're going to maintain that in a very high likely percentage of patients for a very long time. So early diagnosis, early continuous treatment is going to be better, 100%. The early, the early trials were late diseases. All the new trials have, were making the, their smaller CNVs, they're, they're earlier, they're better visions, all of those, and those were getting better results. And so as soon as we, so it's, it's, uh, it's an exciting time. I, I do think we have some great drugs, and I do think there's some great delivery systems coming along. And um, so I think we're going to make a big impact in the next two or three years. And we're running a little low on time, so I think we, I want to get to this next question here. If we could go to the next question, which will probably, probably be our last, is, you know, Bill alluded earlier in, in his investing that he's had, you know, a lot of success in the front of the eye and, and retina has been more challenging for venture capitalists. And I feel the same way at Interwest. We've done, and I'm a retina specialist, so I'm, uh, I think, 0 for 3 on drug, drug delivery in the back of the eye. It's very challenging. And what, 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 are, what are some of those problems? What, we've just got a few minutes, but maybe, maybe for, if each of you just gave, uh, Greg, why don't you go first, but then maybe just give a quick sound bite on what, what's holding it back. Well, uh, uh, the anecdote for me is uh, I, I trained as an internal medicine doctor, and now I love ophthalmology, although I was grossed out in, in medical school by it. But um, you know, I, I, early in my venture capital career, I would sit with ophthalmologists looking at some back of the eye companies, and I would say, take me through the OCTs, take me through the OCTs. And I would look at 20 or 30 with some incredible uh, leaders in the profession. I would get off the phone, and I'd say, oh my god. It is imp there's so much variability. You're in a phase two trial. It is almost impossible to discern if this drug is truly creating a benefit. And I think that that is really the stumper because you move to the phase three trials in this category and it's 1,800 plus patients, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. So the, the venture dollars can really only play in phase one and phase two. And you get there and you say, okay, we've got 20, 40 million dollars to support some innovative uh, drug delivery device or an innovative molecule. Are we actually going to be able to demonstrate proof of concept? Um, what is it going to mean and, and how are we going to create value there? And as we work through that, um, very often we get stumped and, un, unless we see something that's really starting to break technical barriers or figure out a mechanism that is sort of a wow. Dan, you've lived this through a couple companies. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and I've also been on the buy side with Novartis and, and GSK. So it's not like... <laughs> I think the real the real issues for drug companies and why we've seen failures is like ClearSight is not a drug delivery company. We're a drug company. We make a drug that uses the intellect uses the supercortical delivery as our approach. If you don't know what to do with your drug, you need to find get a drug that was, that's going to make you successful. And, and, and just peddling a drug delivery company when I've seen that in the past and relying on somebody else's innovation as your outcome. That's, that's usually where you get tied up in the investments, like you say. It's just this, this, this whole field is really, really large. Reimbursement issues, I think for the most part, reimbursement is there, um, both here and Europe. You're, you're multiplying risk, right? That's the problem with drug delivery companies. If you, if you, if you have a drug, you, let's say you have a 20% risk, 20% uh, chance of success of that drug, taking it through the whole thing early on. If you can get a drug that works 100%, then your, your risk of uh, the drug delivery system, you, you, let's say drug delivery systems have a 50% chance of failure. If you have a 20% chance of failure with, I mean, success with the, 
with the drug and you multiply it times a 50% chance of failure for the delivery system, you have a 10% chance. And, you know, and we go to you guys and you say, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's too much risk. It's going to take too long, you multiplying your risk. But if you have a good drug, you know, then the drug delivery really enables that drug to work better. Well, unfortunately, we're a little low on time. This was, this was a good takeaway. It seems like there's uh, a lot of work to be done, but we've got some good people working on it, both on the clinical side and on the business side. And uh, so I want to thank our panel for a great discussion. Thank you all.